Welcome, everyone. We are so excited. Um, right now, I see we have 157 participants. We are so excited. Mary Elizabeth's sweating a little bit, I can see. Um, this is such an important topic. So welcome to Navigating Cultural and Disability Biases in Healthcare, Building Trust, Building Gaps for New Mainers. And we actually have some um, guests from other states. So we um, like to use the term New Mainers, but, we, but actually there's going to be some terminology explained. So um, New Hampshire's, uh, New Connecticut's, all of those. So Welcome, we are very excited to have you. So um, here are our panelists for today. Um, I am, My job is almost done. I am Audrey Bartholomew. I am Associate Professor at UNE in Special Education. I'm also the Training Director for the Main Lend, which is the Leadership and Education in Neurodevelopmental Disabilities Program on campus, where we train um, healthcare professionals to work with students with disabilities. We also, go ahead, Mary Elizabeth. Oh, I was just to say, hi, my name is Mary Elizabeth Filon, and I am a LEN trainee this year. I'm also working on my master's of public health. And I collaborated on this presentation with Jessica Malloy, who is also another LEN trainee. And unfortunately she's unable to join us here today, but she welcomes you as well. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. Um, and we would like to um, introduce you to Anas Alharbi. Anas is also a former LEN trainee, and she's an, um, a refugee. And so we'll introduce you to her, and you'll get to know her through some clips that we have interspersed throughout our presentation. This is our presentation on cultural responsiveness and implicit bias and how it affects healthcare in the New Mainer population, or really for those of you who are joining from other states, in any state um, where you have um, immigrants. So this presentation is designed to give you an introduction, and we encourage you to continue engaging in assessing and developing your progression of cultural responsiveness while changing or challenging implicit bias influences. The learning objectives are to recognize how cultural identity and disability informs patient experience, to learn how cultural responsiveness improves patient outcomes, and recognize potential internal bias and identify strategies to reduce bias. According to the latest census data, the population of Maine is changing, and our state has seen an increasing numbers of people seeking refuge and asylum. This is really tied to global instability, as individuals and families are increasingly subjected to outside forces beyond their control, jeopardizing their lives, their safety, and their livelihood. Over 4% of the population of Maine are immigrants, and now we're seeing an influx of immigrants from the Middle East and from Africa. Last year, we had 419 refugees settle here in Maine, and this number is projected to double to over 850, or I'm sorry, to over 840 refugees. But already we're seeing in the month of February alone that we have over 90 people coming from Syria, from Congo, and the like. Asylum is also increasing with a 20% increase over the past year, and we're expected to see that number rise as well. There are three types of immigrants. There's refugees, asylum seekers, and migrants. The key point to remember is that refugees and asylum seekers leave because of serious human rights violations, armed conflict, and persecution. These are serious and immediate threats to their lives. Refugees need to flee immediately over the border to a neighboring country where they can then apply for refugee placement. They have no say in which country will accept them, and they may not be able to travel with their families. They cannot return home safely as well. Asylum seekers are also at risk. However, they are able to make their own travel plans, choosing their own country that they'd like to go to, and they declare asylum at the point of entry. If an asylum seeker wants to return home to visit family or for business reasons, they must begin the process anew once arriving back in the United States. Both refugees and asylum seekers may access varying degrees of benefits early on to help transition into communities. However, migrants are completely different. They can voluntarily leave their home country to improve their lives without any threat to their life or safety. And they may travel between countries freely without any penalty. However, there are time constraints on when they can access benefits. Refugees and asylum seekers are informed by significant trauma. We encourage you to learn more about how immigration status impacts access to care. We know that there are social and systemic challenges for both immigrants and people with disability. But what happens when these overlap? This is what's known as a double minority challenge, 
with communication and cultural misunderstandings becoming major drivers of the quality and quantity of healthcare access and received. The end result is often a higher likelihood of significant healthcare disparity that ultimately leads to increased morbidity and mortality. 5.6% of immigrants have some type of disability and half of those have multiple disabilities. We're now seeing an increase in cognitive and intellectual disability. When we are with our patients who are new Mainers, how do we look for disabilities that do not present with typical symptoms in a population that we're unfamiliar with or with whom we may have significant communication challenges? What factors impact care? Let's think about how language, expectations, and culture are aligned. There are invisible scars that contribute to poor physical health, such as trauma of anxiety, stress, fear, uncertainty, physical and sexual assault, violence, war, and natural disasters. Utilizing a trauma-informed approach to care can lead to significant positive long-term mental and physical health outcomes while building trust in the medical system. We'd like to introduce you to Anas El Harvey, and she's partnered with us to share her experience. She and her husband arrived in the United States in 2008 as refugees from Iraq. They were originally settled in Maryland before they moved to Maine. All four of her children have been born in the United States and they have been diagnosed with autism. Both Anas and her husband were trained and worked as civil engineers in Iraq, yet their training and credentials are not valid here in the United States. According to data from the Catholic Charities, 29% of refugees settling here in Maine have a bachelor's degree and 4% have a master's. And often, these credentials will not transfer to employment at the same level in the United States. Anas, like many of her fellow refugees, needed job training and currently works as a special education teacher in the public school system. She has also worked as a cultural broker, helping bridge the gaps for fellow refugees in healthcare and educational systems. Her voice is incredibly powerful and it will give us insight about the needs of immigrants, especially those with disability. Disability isn't acknowledged in many countries, it is poorly defined, and people with disability are invisible and marginalized. We asked Anas how disability was perceived and what treatments or interventions were available in Iraq. Yeah, I feel I'm really lucky to be a mom of disabled kids here in the United States. I'm really lucky. I'm really lucky, especially this kind of disabled, this kind of disability. Back home, this is not even considered disability. It's always, it's either yes or no it's like not even known yet it's like maybe i've been out, out of my country since 2008 and never been there before yet so i've been hearing that it's kind of like people now trying to have more knowledge about it and uh there is sometimes maybe some special schools but when i say special it's 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 kind of private schools so you have to pay for it so if someone can afford it what 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 can happen to that child? So yeah, and and okay, so there are some schools people trying to get some knowledge about it, but like overall the knowledge for all the people, uh, it's bad. They still they can't deal with anyone with disability. So imagine kids. So there's little capacity with a lack of resources and infrastructure to diagnose and treat physical and intellectual disability and there's few specialized doctors or programs available. There are no OTs, PTs, or speech pathologists. And any time that you have access to a doctor or a program, this is only accessible for those who have financial means. The poor training and education for providers will result in the needs of those with disability being ignored and likely maltreated. Disability just isn't part of the community. The idea of disability is a concept that is understood differently in different populations and even within cultures. Here in the United States, we're familiar with disability within a whole range of physical, psychosocial, sensory, neurological, and intellectual impairments, and we contextualize disability within multiple environments. It's completely different in other populations, though, and there may be conflicting views within and between cultures with variable responses. When immigrants suddenly find themselves in the United States, disability is named and defined because we really like to do that here in the U.S. We like to label things. We need to think about how our definitions have multiple implications. What are the societal, political, medical, and educational implications? And how can this suddenly cause new Mainers to question their psychosocial foundations? How does this affect their beliefs and their attitudes and their values? 
What does this bring up in terms of stigma? We asked Anas how cultural perceptions have impacted her family's care. She stressed the importance of having a provider whose care model is based in cultural understanding. It wasn't really that hard. Uh, the, my two first two kids, we were in Maryland, and we were so lucky that we find an Iraqi doctor. She was like really good Iraqi doctor. She, she already been in the States for like uh, 40 years. So she was like really good doctor. And what I liked about her that she has some background of our culture, and that's really good thing. However, it's expected that there will be differing experiences within shared cultural identities. What happens when you don't have a provider who has an understanding of what influences your attitudes, behaviors, and beliefs? Uh, but I, I'm really good. But the thing with my friends, especially like Iraqi cultures, they always have that thing in the mind. Like in Iraq, they don't want the doctor to kind of give them advice as much as the doctor should say what whatever they want to hear. It's like, yeah, and in and, and Iraq, they, they want the doctor always to give you medication. So if the doctor will tell you to go have rest, drink water, that's not a good doctor. That's at all not a good doctor. So when Anas tells us about her friend's experiences, you can begin to see how cultural perceptions shape the range of healthcare experience. And if we need to think about where our patients and clients are coming from. What is their familiar model of care? Why was healthcare needed? How was healthcare accessed? Who do patients interact with? What were the expectations? And where were services provided? So back in Iraq and even now, we don't have insurance in Iraq. You always pay out of your bucket. And there's no one can't go to a doctor. Like there's always someone can help if you really need a doctor. So family will help, like brothers, sisters, whatever. So there's, you always uh, go to the doctor like when you want. And you always, maximum, if that doctor is so, so busy, you will call day ahead to schedule appointment for tomorrow. So you always go walk in the same day. Maybe it will be like that doctor is so busy and so famous, there will be 10 people before you and whoever come, like we, someone that's courtly will write you and you write your numbers and then you will go after one another. So maybe you're gonna wait three, four hours but what I'm saying, you're going to see the doctor same day. So when we first came and you're in pain, and then you're going to go to your PCP and PCP, you're like, okay, I'm going to call the referral center and referral center, they will, they will talk, refer you to a specialist and specialist will call you after two weeks, like to schedule the appointment. And that will be another two weeks. That was like, that was frustrating for us. Like I'm in pain, like, and whatever is like, going on with me after one month, like I can't get, like, explain it to you anymore. Like it's not there anymore. So, so that was, and even till now, my husband is always getting like, like when he's in pain or whatever, like go to the doctor. And he say like, he will keep it. No, I will not go because like, that's what happened. I will see a doctor after what, two weeks. And I'm like, well, that's not good. You have to see that doctor. And he's like, doctor will not see me when I'm in pain. So again, in Iraq, you will see the doctor in the same day. Anas reveals how timeframes have varying degrees of acceptability of cross cultures. This may be a concept that many new Mainers struggle with in the United States healthcare system. And this frustration and confusion may affect how new Mainers approach an appointment and what the level of receptiveness they have to care. As providers, we have a responsibility to ground the medical model of care we provide within a culturally responsive manner. So what is cultural responsiveness? It's an ongoing process to acknowledge, address, and understand attitudes, behaviors, and values of individuals. This is a reciprocal interaction between you and your patient. This involves understanding the individual and the community you are or you will be working with. What are the local and individual needs and conditions? Cultural responsiveness demonstrates respect for each individual's ability, age, culture, ethnicity, gender, language and dialect, national or regional origin, race, religion, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status. We purposely have chosen to use the term cultural responsiveness instead of cultural competency because we want to highlight that this is an ongoing dynamic process. Providers need to identify appropriate information, interventions, and assessment strategies, and then adjust your clinical approach by integrating traditions, customs, and values into the service delivery.
and you need to take care to avoid violating the person's beliefs and principles or alienating them from their clinicians, their community, or their support systems, including their families. Engaging cultural brokers who are trusted community members with shared language and experiences can help bridge the gaps and build trust between patients and providers. Let's say at the hospitals, each hospital should have a, a cultural broker and should be in appointment with like someone from a different background because it's like completely different worlds. So that patient come from a different world and that doctor from different world. And sometimes they will be like talking really different ways and both each other can really get their other minds differently, really differently. So like I even when I worked as interpreter, that was a thing. So the doctor will say something. And if I have to say exactly what the doctor is saying, the patient will take it in a completely different way. Yeah. But I have to, now I have to say extra things about this is the way goes things here. This is the way the system goes here. So take it easy. And then the doctor, will, the patient will start to talk and answer or even ask question. I will have to say exactly what what he's saying or she's saying, then the doctor can be like, close his eyes, like what's going on? And again, I have to always say, this is what, that's what happened in, in their country. That's how it goes in their country. It doesn't make, it's not personal. It's not you. It's, it's not anything about even like the system or whatever. This is how it goes there. And for that, it's confusing for them. So I wish like the doctor doctors always put it in their mind it's it's not personal it's it's not you it's not the system they not like being kind of like disrespectful to the state or to the united states even it's it's just different that they just came from a different world completely different world it's not that doesn't make, it's not like it's a bad or, or less word. It's just different. I think what Inas says is so powerful. It's really important to ensure that cultural brokers and interpreters are effective communicators to both you and your patient. Utilizing appropriate interpretation services promotes the opportunity to capture a full and comprehensive social and medical history. Best practice is to work with trained paraprofessionals to ensure confidentiality. Recognize that the choice to engage a cultural broker or an interpreter is the patient's alone, as they may not want their private medical information shared. Relying on family members or children to interpret can affect care as well. Interpretation may be, or I'm sorry, information may be summarized, left out, and own opinions may be communicated instead of a patient's. They may even ask a totally different question that they think is relevant. Some medical content is inappropriate for children and places undue burden and stress. To provide culturally responsive treatment services, clinicians, staff, and organizations need to become aware of their own attitudes, belief, biases, and assumptions about others. Our failure to consider other cultures and ability can be rooted in implicit bias. Implicit bias is a culture or is a barrier to culturally responsive behaviors, and it creates opportunities for the failure of patient-centered care. What are the quick associations you have of race, disability, and language differences? It can be very uncomfortable to examine the root causes of implicit bias, and it's necessary because implicit bias influences our actions and thought processes, and it creates direct threats to our patients' health and well-being. Research shows that increased implicit bias leads to worse health outcomes, increased disparity in care, increased misdiagnosis, limiting of treatment options offered, overuse or underuse of interventions, medications and therapies, and decreased participatory decision-making. Healthcare bias is multifactorial. Implicit bias influences provider behaviors and clinical decision-making abilities, and although subconscious and involuntary in nature, affects the way providers humanize the patient experience. Perhaps information is withheld or altered because of comprehension and literacy assumptions. Patients can pick up on provider body language and verbal cues, and this healthcare bias can lead to patients feeling perhaps embarrassed or uncertain, frustrated or inferior. And this will lead to overall feelings of not being seen or heard, a reluctance to seek care, low compliance rates, loss of faith in the system, and ultimately ends up with increased health disparity. So when we're thinking about strategies, what are strategies that you can use to improve your cultural responsiveness and help you reduce your implicit bias? 
First, reflect on your implicit bias. What assumptions and stereotypes do you make about your patients? Are there assumptions about a patient's body language or health literacy that stems from racial or disability stereotyping? Your second thing is to be intentional. Acknowledge the root causes of your implicit bias. Pay attention. Be mindful of your thoughts and actions. And lastly, know that this process of debiasing takes time and that you need to practice this. Adopt a strength-based approach as well. Increase opportunities for contact. Anas told us about her, how her culture values conversation and timely access. Build in a few minutes and appointments to allow your patients to talk to you about their personal lives. They might reveal important information that they might not have considered relevant to your line of questioning. Use clear and common language. Inclusive identity first language reduces stigma. Practice effective communication. Ask about the communication preferences and learn how to access and use interpreters. And lastly, think about the principles of universal design. What does the environment look like? And do new Mainers see themselves reflected in the physical space, in signs, symbols, and the delivery of care? We urge you to continue to seek out educational opportunities to expand your awareness. Look for books and podcasts, read the newspaper articles, and talk with your patients. So we are going to go into an exercise now before we go into the breakout rooms. And I really would like you all to take a moment and think about your five closest confidence and friends. Who are the people who you call when you have something incredibly exciting to share? When you need to talk through something, whose opinions do you ask about social media pictures that you want to post? Who would you ask to watch your pet? So I'd like to give everybody a few moments to reflect on this. Okay, so if everybody will join me and hold up your hand and extend all five fingers. Put one finger down if your circle of trust all is within five years of your age. Put one finger down if you all share the same gender. Put another finger down if you celebrate the same holidays. Another finger if you speak the same native language. And also put the last finger down if you share similar educational backgrounds. How many fingers do you have up? People who share experiences look for people and continue to favor people with whom we see our values and beliefs reflected in because it's comfortable and it's validating. And this unintentionally strengthens our implicit bias. We want you to take this awareness of who informs your world and choices into the breakout rooms as we think about several questions. So, and before we do that, let's take a look at the word cloud and see how diverse this group is who's here today. I mean, we have people from all over the world. And that means that our experiences are all different. How we understand things are all different. So just take a moment and, and reflect upon that because it, it really is a global community who's joining us here today. And I think if we look at the second poll, and this has come before we came into this program. I mean, think about where you came with your idea of where you stand in terms of what your implicit bias level is. So we have it kind of most people kind of thinking that they have a little bit and somewhat, and perhaps this training today has given you an idea of, of where you stand and helps you to reevaluate that and to think about the work that you might want to do so that you can impact the way that you provide care. So we're going to look at our prompts now. And um, when we go into our breakout rooms, we're going to ask our, each other and, and talk about what our circle of trust looks like and how does our circle influence our views and our perceptions? And were you even aware of how similar or how different your circle is? And can you think of ways that implicit bias impacts care? What are the potential blind spots and what actions can you take to reduce the impact of bias in your practice? And lastly, let's think about our own expectations of healthcare appointment. We know what to do. We know how to make call up our doctor, correct? We know how to what we what's expected of us that we show up a little bit early that there's going to be forms to fill out that we might have to wait um but perhaps how is this different from your patients so what do you think that, that how this could impact the way that they perceive care so i believe that we're going to be sorted now into breakout rooms and once we're there please turn on your cameras introduce yourselves identify your program and your profession and then identify a facilitator if you don't have one and ask someone to keep notes uh, of what comes up and together um, review the exercise and these discussion prompts.
from each of your program's point of view. And then when we come back together, we're going to share our takeaways. Valerie, what did your group have to say? Very looking right at you. Okay. I wasn't prepared to um, to report because we had a, a note taker. But one of the things um, that came out was the shift that people's circle of trust can have based on their time of life or their location, um, that they may have grown up in some area and have an established circle of trust, but that might shift mm -hmm. as they move to somewhere else. Um, so that was one thing we talked about. Great, and sorry to just call on you, but you were right. That's okay. <laughs> so, does anyone in your group wanna add to that from what you talked about? Room 17, I don't know who was room 17, but there were similarities in the circle, same language, not a ton of diversity. People didn't have a lot of experience outside of their own group. Um, so some went to college, some didn't go to college. And touching on biases we learned about or noticed in medicine, more available healthcare research. So what are you learning um, in about bias and implicit bias and working with different populations um, to address implicit bias. I'm really curious if that came up in any of your groups. And please, um, Mary Elizabeth and Audrey, you chime in as well. I know that in our group, um, we had a few members who told us about how they have family members who are coming from different countries and they continue to travel back to those countries of origin because they don't feel comfortable or don't have the ability to, to navigate the healthcare system here in the United States. And that is a, a real eye opener. I think that um, one of our members might, um, he told us that he's from um, Colombia and that their family member received dental care here in the United States when the dentist came up to visit and so he brought his bag with him and his traveling supplies and was able to provide care in that manner. So I, I think that that tells us a lot about where people who are, are new to this country, how they're actually able to access care and and what their comfort levels are and and perhaps where the barriers really continue to lie. Wow, that's very powerful. Others, Ed, what about in your group? So we had, um, if Courtney... Um... We had, we had somebody that took notes, Courtney, and if she's willing to um, yeah. unmute and share a little bit, I think that'd be great. One of the things that we talked about, hold on, I'm just pulling my notes. Um, so one of the couple of ways we talked about for reducing bias is one way is exploring the community. So even if it's not in a medical way, getting, getting out and getting to know people of different cultures in your community, or if your community is not that diverse, consuming that information via the media. So reading different information or watching different information on cultures. And then we also talked about just making um, your environment, whether that be a doctor's office or whatever type of environment you're working in to be more accepting and display different types of cultures in the waiting room, for example, might help more people feel more included and more comfortable. Great. Thank you. I'd love to invite our New Haven folks to maybe chime in. Susan, would you like to chime in? I just asked if any of the groups would be willing to talk. For those of you here, we have an entire classroom from the University of New Haven joining us for today's event. Okay, introduce yourself. Uh, hello, I'm Max um, Mendez, um, majoring in um, health care, health care, health care, yeah, and I want to be a speech language pathologist. Um, our groups like talked about uh, um, just like the different perspectives. Like it's all about really like trying to understand like where people are coming from. Need to communicate because we talk about like maybe like communicating something, but the other person doesn't like understand or like they don't, they don't have a frame of reference or something like that. It's just, just making sure like people understand and all that stuff. That's how it's kind of like that's what we talked about and like um. I don't know, like different cultures, like maybe perceived and like how you like deal with that and like how you deal with like, um you know, like seeing someone for the first time, like if they're like different from you, like how your bias can play into that and you sh should like acknowledge that and like um, um, make sure it doesn't like affect any like your judgment 
and this chair by like an individ individual and like a person. So I don't know. That's what it's kind of talked about. Thank you. <laughs> Very nice. Thank you, Nick. That was great. Max is Max is in his uh, first year. Yes, he's a in his freshman. <laughs> All right. Great. Wow. Thank you. I know that in, in my room, Nick from Dental Hygiene had some really powerful points, and I don't know if Nick wants to light up or not, um, but really talking about the importance of asking, you know, asking open-ended questions and, you know, not being afraid to say, I don't know, but to say, could you tell me more about um, and so that, and, and there were an, other comments that, that sometimes can feel really uncomfortable that folks don't know whether to ask is to be disrespectful or to ask is to be respectful. And, and you know, I don't know, Mary Elizabeth, my take on that is who knows? You know, you ask and then you see, right? But asking open-ended questions is really important. Susan, did you have something else you wanted to add? I have another student. <laughs> Okay. Um, so we had a, a really interesting discussion. Um, I think at, within our table, there was only one person that was born in the United States. So we were able to talk about what healthcare looks across different people's, um, like different countries and uh, just what healthcare expectations might look like in terms of similar to what Inas was talking about, like same day appointments, insurance, payments but also like accessibility of emergency services as well um we're, we're pretty we're pre our ambulances are pretty fast in the united states is something that i learned um which is which is you know fortunate They're, they also tend to be very expensive which is unfortunate um and people might not know about the costs associated with like ambulances and emergency service care um and we also talked about within like your circle of trust it's natural for folks to lean towards people that are similar to them. It's a source of comfort. We talked about how within our circles of trust, um, a lot a lot of us tend to focus around our family. And that might also be something that um, we've coming into America, a lot of folks have realized that there's a culture of like when you turn 18, having that independence and that kind of, you know, finding finding uh, yourself, whereas um in other cultures there's no shame and it's encouraged to live with your parents or your family for years and years into adulthood and taking care of them and kind of that more um collective culture um so and that obviously translates into healthcare and how involved a family can be in somebody's healthcare regardless of their age like it's not just parents going to appointments with um their children it's children going to appointments with their parents and with their grandparents and having that kind of um, familiar familial uh support great thank you so much i'm i'm sad to say that's all the time we have for the debrief and the questions and answers and i want to thank everybody for attending we had great participation in our groups mary elizabeth you are amazing Thank you so much. No, you really were amazing. And thank you for your the information that you shared. Um, we just want to remind people that we have one more to go, a knowledge exchange that's coming up. Um, and what we really wanted to focus on is integrated health care and looking at the integration of physical and behavioral health care. And so we're going to have a group of folks come and talk with us about a program that's working and what the hiccups are. And it's maximizing OUD recovery potential through integration and whole person care. Um, and so we really hope you'll stick with us and come join us uh, next Wednesday, March 27th, 12 to 1. And uh, please fill out the attendance link. And um, thank you very much for being here today. This was fantastic. And Audrey, thank you to you too. And Sin and us are very great. Thank you. For, for being willing to be open and honest with us. Thank you so much. And Susan and UNH, see you again next time.